Thank you everyone for joining. It looks like we are ready to begin. Today's webinar is introducing the DJI Matrice 300 in Zenmuse H20 series. My name is Mark Flam and I'm the Enterprise Sales and Support Manager at DSLR Pros. Today's webinar is hosted by DSLR Pros and is featuring DJI. And I'm really happy to introduce today's panel. Joining us from DJI, first we have Romeo. Romeo, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, good morning and good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we are excited to have you here and we're excited to talk about a new product. I oversee the public safety integration of our technology here at DJI. And as such, over the last five years, we definitely have learned a lot of uh, things that we're trying to incorporate in current and future platforms. And thanks to the feedback from not only the likes of our friends at DSLR Pros, but also from the end users, uh, we can really build upon that feedback. And uh, we're excited that today we can talk about the Matrice 300 RTK. Thanks, Romeo. Also joining us is Derek Ward. Yeah, thanks, Mark. My name's Derek Ward. I've got over 31 years with one of the largest and busiest fire departments in the country. I'm also a co-lead drone pilot, the director of public safety for Enterprise UAS. We train nationally, police, fire, and commercially, uh, drone technology, building programs and best practices. And just want to say I'm excited to be here with Mark, Romeo, and Francisco. We should have a good webinar. Thanks, Derek. Also joining us is Francisco Toro. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Francisco Toro. I am with the Solution Engineering Team here at DJI. Um, I've been working at DJI for a little over half a decade now, um, and I, I work closely with our R&D team and uh, with our partners here in the U.S. capturing their requirements. Thanks, Francisco. And thank you guys for joining us today, and thanks to all our guests who joined as well. And again, my name is Mark Flam. I'm the Enterprise Sales and Support Manager at DSLR Pros. I'll start off with a really quick introduction about us. Established in 2012, DSLR Pros has been assisting police and fire departments and industrial and agricultural service providers to launch and scale their own drone programs. We offer technical support, training classes, repair services, and wholesale distribution. We're an authorized DJI, PIX4D, FLIR, MicaSense, and SenseFly partner and are located in Southern California. A couple of quick notes about today's webinar. This webinar is being recorded and we'll share the recording with you all afterwards. We encourage you to ask questions in the question panel throughout the webinar and we'll do our best to answer them at the end. We have a great panel today with thought leaders from DJI and the public safety industry. So if you have questions, now's a great time to get answers. And here's a look at our, our agenda for today's webinar. We'll start off with an evolution of DJI's enterprise products. Then we'll discuss the performance of the Matrice 300, look at the safety and reliability features, discuss the advanced intelligence, and there's some really new cool tech being introduced here. Then we'll look at the extensibility and openness and finish off with a good old Q&A. So Romeo, can you run us through the evolution of DJI's enterprise product line? Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Mark. It, it's very exciting to go back and, and Francisco and I both have had the pleasure to really be in all of this from the very early beginning. One piece that we're, we are not seeing on this chart goes actually back to 2014 and I think um, it should actually be on it. In fact, uh, I modified this chart for my own purposes to showcase the uh, release of the SDK, the Software Development Kit, which was a real milestone in 2014, uh, allowing third-party uh, solution providers write code, in an essence an app, just like we download on our smart devices, to do certain uh, features. And that has really been um, a key component through today because so many applications come through our SDK partners. Obviously, then we released the Matrice 100, which was in essence uh, developed for those um, coding partners that wanted to test some of those codes. Uh, for the first time, we also had uh, sensing uh, additional equipment that would do the sensing and object detection that could go on there and was really meant as a platform uh, for, for a lot of the testing. And, uh, also, at the end of 2014, we released the Inspire One, and 
uh, to this day, I like to say that it was way ahead of its time. It was probably and still is one of the coolest drones that ever hit the market, especially with that retractable landing gear and that very futurist, futuristic Star Wars type of look. But then in, in uh, late 2015, for the first time, uh, we, we added a payload, a secondary payload to a platform, and that was the DJI FLIR XT. And many of you remember back in those days, you had to really make a decision which payload to fly, visible light camera or a thermal camera. And that is, you know, something that's very difficult because uh, oftentimes uh, you, you want to have both, but you couldn't. Then uh, moving on, the Z30 came out in 2016, the first time we had this incredible uh, zoom camera that also had uh, the gimbal stabilization as well as electronic stabilization, and it really opened up a lot of new opportunities. Then I'm going to jump a little bit forward. Uh, the Matrice 200 series was released in 2017, and that was really based on the first almost two years of lessons learned working with public safety entities. And one of the biggest things that we wanted to, to solve is uh, not having to pick one payload or one camera over the other. So the idea was, let's create a platform where we can have two different payloads on it. And that way, uh, we don't have to pick and choose, we can just have them on and we can switch back and forth. Uh, the following year, we released the second generation of the X-T2. And the X-T2 was a very, very interesting project because one thing that we learned quickly with the original X-T was if you as an operator fly with a full screen thermal, uh, you have the, uh, or you, you tend to lose situational and orientational awareness because our brain is just not uh, built to see the environment in all these different colors, or even if you have it in, in hot white or black uh, hot, um, it, the brain has just a little bit more difficult seeing all the details and realizing where in the 3D space you're looking at. And if you have then to describe the information, it was difficult. So we wanted to do um, a two camera payload where you have the ability to not only have side by side, but also uh, overlay thermal on top of visible light in the center screen so that you still see where you're actually looking at by seeing the visible light around the thermal. And that was definitely another huge step. Uh, moving forward, uh, also that year the Phantom 4 RTK came out and then in 2019 um, a, the Mavic 2 Enterprise and we wanted to do a smaller quick deploy platform that has accessories that can be utilized depending on a certain uh, mission profile and need as well as the ability to have a low res thermal and visible light camera. And that was really to enhance the capabilities of the M200 line up until that point. And then going a little bit further in, in the timeline, uh, the DM200 version 2 came out. And then last year, we also released the P4 multispectral platform, um, which was definitely a, another step forward in, 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 in the progression. And now uh, we're super excited that we have a Matrice 300 platform that in essence has been built by the feedback and the lessons learned over the last four years. And there are a lot of product safety features that have come since the early days to make it what it is today. And as you remember, uh, in 2014 and 15, we started with the geofencing of our platforms as a tool. So operators would uh, know if they were flying in an environment that could be um, unsafe, like a controlled airspace environment, um, and, and just as a tool to really help educate uh, mostly the, the hobbyist users. And what we learned over time also in regards to geofencing was that uh, we have entities like public safety or utilities that are supposed to fly in certain environments and have the proper approval that we need to find ways to get them unlocked. And we released uh, uh, a little bit over a year ago, the quality, qual 
qualified entities program, uh, which right now for public safety allows a full unlock of their aircrafts. And so absolutely we're listening to the market, but we will continue to enforce anything that we can to improve the safety of these products. Uh, that includes the altitude limitations. Uh, they're limited to 400 feet from takeoff uh, location. Uh, there are abilities to increase that as well, but it will stop at 400. Um, the flight distance warnings. Obviously, we are also a, a supporter of remote ID, the electronic license plate in, in the sky, in essence. Uh, we believe uh, it is it, it helps the transparency factor as well as also the behavior. If there is a way um, for entities to identify if an aircraft or a drone um, is in the sky, are they flying under uh, authorization and so on. And obviously we also continue to implement our AirSense ADSB receivers, um, now also in consumer products, not just in enterprise product. And that's really important because as operators, it is our responsibility to yield to crewed aircraft. So knowing um, a aircraft is inbound really allows us as operators to make better decisions. And obstacle sensing definitely is a big feature also now on the M300. And on the product security side, this is a topic that we do take seriously at, at DJI and we have introduced on the enterprise side a password protection on the internal data storage. Uh, if a customer decides to sync data, it will go on a US-based AWS server and I want to really point out that there is no data going outside of that and you as the operator uh, have the full control over what is being shared. And I'll give you a good example. If you have, let's say, three drones, and you would like to combine the three flight logs of those drones into one, there's a feature where you can sync that to this US-based AWS server from all three drones, and it creates, in essence, an, a list of all the flights that have been done. And that only goes to that US-based AWS server. It doesn't go abroad, despite um, a lot of the rumors that are out there. We have local data mode. If you are operating in a more sensitive environment, you have the ability to engage local data mode that really cuts off all the transmission from your smart device uh, to the net. The drone itself does not have transmission capabilities. There are no LTE, 4G, 5G uh, chips in the drone. The communication piece happens through either the smart device or a crystal sky that can be uh, attached to or connected to a Wi-Fi or a 4G LTE network. Our Flight Hub software uh, operates on the Azure and our uh, communication link between the operator and the drone is a AES-556 encryption-based uh, transmission. We will continue to improve and enhance our security because we understand that um, there are different security aspects and demands. Uh, the, the demands are very different for a local uh, fire department than a potential federal agency, so we do have to provide uh, various levels of security protocols, but also as an industry, uh, proper data security standards need to be developed so all manufacturers can properly uh, comply with those standards. Got it. Thanks, Romeo. And you hit on something really important, which is the, well, you hit on a lot of really important things, including the Qualified Entities Program, which was recently released by DJI. If there's anybody in the audience that feels that their agency would qualify for that and would benefit from that, I strongly encourage you to reach out to either support at DSLR Pros, Mark at DSLR Pros, leave us a chat. Uh, we can help connect you with the right people at DJI can, who, who can unlock your aircraft for your region. And we've helped a lot of customers through this process and it's made them uh, able to deploy in a lot more different situations. So if you think you would benefit from QEP, send me an email and I'll help you get started. So next up, we're gonna take a look at the uh, flight performance of the Matrice 300. So the Matrice 300 has a 55 minute flight time. With the H20T, which is the new thermal and zoom camera installed, the effective flight time is 36 minutes. 
And for comparison, the Matrice 200 with a similar zoom and thermal setup had a 15 minute flight time. So that's a 21 minute increase from its predecessor. Okay, now we're taking a look at the new and much needed charging station. So this charges eight batteries at a time and takes 60 minutes to charge up a set. So with the new batteries and charging case, DJI, how, DJI has now enabled nonstop continuous flight. So what that means is by the time your last battery is drained, your first battery has recharged, allowing you to fly continuously. So how awesome is this ability for continuous flight, guys? How do you foresee public safety agencies or other companies being able to benefit from this feature? You know, Mark, uh, if I can just kick in here, it, it's extremely important, especially when we need to have real-time data on an ongoing basis. We're, we're up at a, a brush fire and we're looking over a specific canyon or something to that effect, and we are transmitting information to the IC and other places. To be able to stay in the air without having to be interrupted is of huge value. And I'd also like to say about the encrypting of the, the uh, 300, that public safety already have policies and pr procedures in place for data retention. In addition to strict compliance and existing laws, to have this type of technology that's encrypting this information and make it even safer is totally beneficial to public safety. Got it, thanks Derek. And one other thing to note is this will also charge up to four of the WB37 batteries. Those are the Crystal Sky batteries or the Ascendance batteries, which are also compatible with the new Enterprise Smart RC. So this case will charge those up as well. So it's a nice charging solution and something that we definitely need. Okay, now we're discussing the M300 transmission range. With a 9.3 mile max, trans max transmission range, it's basically double the range of a M200, a Mavic 2 Pro, or an Inspire 2. So with these increased flight times and range specs, DJI is really putting some distance between the M300 and their other systems. So on the industrial side, with the increased flight time and increased range, you can inspect more assets per day, which means more, more increased efficiency for your crews. And on the public safety side, the extra flight time and range could be the difference between success and failure. So we're seeing some really big improvements in terms of flight time and range, almost doubling what the M200 was offering. And uh, did you guys have anything to add there on the flight range or time? Well, I'll add again that uh, while we're on an emergency or we're looking over a canyon, we have many pilots that are on scene and we need to be able, we can basically with these smart controllers hand off, right? So we'll fly the area, we'll go as far as we can see, we're able to hand off now, the, the controller will switch off and you guys will talk more about that later, but you're able to switch off to the other pilot and he can take control and continue that flight. And that brings a lot of tremendous value to the incident. And not only that, I mean, we can talk more about it later also, but the second controller we can transmit video with. So we'll discuss that later, but just the ability to hand off and be able to take a lot longer distance on a canyon or wherever else we're flying, it could be a swift water rescue. That's a huge value. Yeah, definitely. And even if you don't plan on flying out to that full, you know, nine mile range, that means that if you're flying in complex environments, you're going to have, you know, a stronger ability to penetrate through obstacles, even at close range. So you're going to have improved performance because it's now overpowered for shorter flights. So that'll be really huge on the industrial side where they're flying in areas with high interference. All right. So now we're going to take a look at the new payloads. Uh, so listen up because this, these, these new cameras are game changers. So this is a slide I'm really excited for. So up first, we're going to talk about the H20. This is a zoom camera plus a wide angle camera plus a laser rangefinder all in one. The primary sensor is 20 megapixels, which is very high resolution. For context, the Z30 is 2 megapixels. And the X5S, which is widely considered a cinema camera, is 20.8 megapixels. So this, this sensor on the H20 is really high resolution and the image quality is through the roof. And next, we're going to look at the zoom range. The H20 is capable of a 23 at times hybrid optical zoom. So that's based on going from the wide angle 24 millimeter lens to the end of the zoom lens, which is 556 millimeters. That's what DJI means by hybrid optical. It's using both cameras wide and zoom to achieve the full 23 times optical zoom at 20 megapixels. So next we're gonna look at the H20T. This is the same as the H20, but it also has the thermal camera. So a little bit about the thermal camera. This is a 640 resolution, 30 frames per second radiometric sensor with a 13 millimeter lens. And those are very similar specs to what you'd see on an X-T1 or an X-T2, which were the previous flagship thermal cameras. 
And just for those who aren't familiar, radiometric refers to the ability to extract and store temperature data from every pixel in the image, as opposed to just viewing the thermal image on the monitor. So that's really important on the industrial side if you want to be able to store that data, reference it later, report on it, and share with other people. And something to keep in mind is some of the more entry-level drones, like the Mavic 2 Dual, they don't have the ability to store this radiometric data. This is something you only see as you move into XT1, XT2, or H20T. So we also have the new laser range finder. This has a 4,000 foot detection range and it allows, you know, basically allows operators to get an accurate distance reading between the drone and a target. It also enables some pretty cool AI features that we're gonna take a look at later on in the slide. Uh, and another thing to consider is the, the range finder itself is not detectable by the naked eye, which I know is important for public safety applications. Okay, guys, so what do you think? What are your thoughts on the zoom, thermal, or laser range finder? How do you think operators are going to benefit from these three new sensors? Well, I know Romeo can elaborate on this quite a bit also, but I can see this technology is a game changer in lots of ways. Um, I'll just start with search and rescue. When we're out there doing a search and rescue, we're searching long distances, great big areas, and to be able to identify a specific patient on the ground and then put the range finder on them to identify the longitude and the latitude, and then give that information to the IC and incoming companies is extremely valuable. We're gonna save a lot of time in, in conducting that rescue. And then once again, we could be on a brush fire and we're able to identify hot spots and then guide companies, income, companies coming in to do extinguishment. So that's another great capability. And then to have the thermal and the wide angle lens and the zoom on one camera is huge because now you're able to actually verify things with, with the zoom camera that you're finding with the, the thermal camera. So lots of times as we're using these, even with the X-T2, we're, we're actually looking and finding things in that thermal camera, that thermal image. We're seeing that we have something, but we need to use that zoom camera to verify what we have. So we're using all three of these tools all on one payload, which is extremely tech, techy and awesome. I mean, it's really a, a game changer. Got it. And what about the rangefinder, guys? I, I think Derek, you 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 hit it right on, on the head there. Um, you know, if you look at the progression from a single sensor camera to two sensor cameras, now we're at three and at four different sensors in one camera. That is a, a tremendously helpful setup. And we did decide to include the laser rangefinder because we did get a lot of feedback uh, the last uh, two years or so that it would be so helpful to know the distance. And here's the very, very fascinating thing about public safety. Um, they're very uh, good in coming up with using available solutions. And I am convinced over the next several months, we will be learning about new use cases thanks to this laser rangefinder, which then allow us in the background to do additional uh, software features and, and, and calculations so that the data uh, becomes even more helpful. We want to provide the end user or an incident command with actionable data as quickly as possible. And you're getting so much more data in a very um, well-defined environment than ever before. Got it, thank you, Romeo. Okay, now let's take a look at the new user face on the Matrice 300. Uh, this new UI makes it easy to switch between the wide angle, zoom, thermal, and rangefinder. So we'll start off with a quick video. So now we can see we're on the zoom lens, switching to the wide angle. Now on the thermal. So pretty impressive, but just a touch of a button, you're able to switch between each, each different sensor. And I'll give an example here as well. So the first image we're looking at right now is a thermal shot. This is all taken, all these images are taken from the same drone, same camera, same location at the same time. So first we have a, a thermal shot. Now we're looking at a wide angle shot. Now I'm looking at the full optical zoom. Now I'm looking at the full digital zoom. So just again, we're able to go from this wide angle with great situational awareness all the way down into this full digital zoom. So it's a really impressive zoom camera there. And the fact that you have a thermal camera side by side gives you great situational awareness. 
Okay, so moving right along, we're going to discuss safety and reliability. So the Matrice 300 features a six-way omnidirectional obstacle avoidance system. So if you're flying in complex environments like power lines, windmills, infrastructure inspection, you'll appreciate this extra safety. This is also a big improvement from the Matrice 200, which featured top, front, and bottom obstacle avoidance only. So basically we're saying M300 obstacle avoidance all over every direction versus its predecessor M200 was only top, bottom, and front. Uh, the drone also has uh, top and bottom anti-collision beacons and auxiliary lights. So guys, can you tell us a little bit about why these beacons are so important? Well, I, I'll, I'd like to talk a little bit about the six-way obstacle avoidance system. I mean, that's phenomenal. And something that's also very unique is you can actually adjust what that looks like. So there's many times when we're flying, we could be down below in a canyon and not necessarily having a good view of the drone or where we're looking at it, but it can get skewered in smoke and, and trees sometimes while we're flying. And to have that six-way obstacle avoidance is crucial to keep it away uh, and safe. The other thing, and that also releases that liability of having an issue. But the other thing is, is if you actually have to get into a tight situation with some of the other systems that we've been flying, you either have to turn it on or back off again in order to do that. So you're getting into a tight area, you got to turn your obstacle avoidance off in order to do it. With this, you can actually change how many feet you need to go into a specific area, which is giving you more capability, keeping your flight a lot safer and mitigating a, a lot of liability. So I, I really see a lot of value in that. Got it, Absolutely, thanks. Absolutely, Derek. Uh, and, and you know, the top and bottom lights, uh, obviously with now night waivers in place, we want to create a solution that out of the box has the safety features that are needed so you can perform according to your uh, nighttime waivers. So having not only the, the bottom and the top uh, anti-collision beacons available at night, um, but also you can utilize them during daytime to enhance your own visibility. Uh, even when you fly down in that canyon, now you see the top beacon, uh, you know, flashing once every while, and that helps. And if you're flying a, 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 the drone above your head, then you have the, the bottom auxiliary lights that can also help you with, with the orientation of the aircraft. So uh, really out of the box safety features that benefit any type of operation. Gotcha. And what about these auxiliary lights? What do, what do you guys think about those? How are we going to benefit from these new auxiliary LED lights? Well, there's lots of ways. But I'll give you an example quickly. Um, when we're using our thermal camera, we're getting a thermal image. But a lot of times we want to see a number on a placard or something like that. So the ability to actually have a thermal image and then a real-time uh, regular camera image on the same screen you're able to and you, then you also have the lighting system so now you can actually see what you're looking at with that visual camera now you have everything you need in order to do your job so those tools are are very powerful got it got it thanks um any other thoughts on this guys one thing I could see for the auxiliary LED lights is uh, also just helping the obstacle avoidance systems work better in shadowy areas or low light areas. Uh, you know, those obstacle avoidance need some ambient light to work. So the auxiliary LED lights will definitely help with that. Like if you're coming in for a landing and it's dark or it's shadowy, it'll, it'll illuminate the ground and then the sensors can work better to help, uh, to help aid with the landing. All right, so now we're gonna take a look at the M300's ingress protection rating. And I get really deep into the IP ratings in our M200 versus M300 uh, comparison video, which is on YouTube. So I encourage you guys all, after this is done, go check out that video if you really want to get into that. Uh, just on a high level, the, the Matrice 300 is an IP45 IP rating. And to explain that, the first number four refers to protection against solids like dust and debris. The second number five refers to protection against water. So that five is defined as being able to withstand jets of water from all sides. So basically this means you can keep flying even in a heavy rainstorm and that'll, that'll allow you to have less downtime. So obviously this is a huge, huge benefit for public safety operations. Derek, Romeo, have you guys ever been called out to fly in the rain? 
So yeah, public safety, you don't really get to pick when the emergency takes place, right? I mean, we're out there and it could be in the middle of summer, but it can be in a, a bad downpour also where, where we're doing something, a, a search and rescue or whatever else it might be. Um, so the ability for the drone to withstand the rain or water or even heavy smoke and, and debris that's in the air from heat, preheated gases and stuff, it's, it's really what you need. That's the type of tool you need if you're going to be out flying in those conditions. Yeah, got it. Well said. The one thing oh. that I would mention here is, uh, you know, at the end of the day, we as operators, it's it's our call when to fly and not to fly. Uh, obviously, there are certain pieces of regulation in place, but when it comes to a life-saving environment, um, when it's really about life and death, uh, you want to have a little bit more insur assurance that the, the equipment can be used because as we know, that search and rescue operation rarely happens on a beautiful, sunny, no wind type of day. That's a great point, Romeo, that we train our firefighters with the same philosophy. And that is that you're the pilot in command and, you know, you may be called out to fly a fire or a, an event or whatever it might be. And you're the one that needs to make the decision whether you can safely fly that that aircraft or not. So you need to take all that into place. That also has to do with a lot of the training and actually going out and flying in these different environments um, to be familiar with your capability as a pilot and the aircraft's capability. So when you have new technology like this, it's gonna be extremely important for the pilot to understand what it's capable of to be able to make that decision on whether or not to fly. Got it, yeah, and just even to, just even to add to that, you may just be flying on a clear day and then it begins to rain or you're flying on a cloudy day and it starts raining or maybe you're flying and the drone takes a splash because you're flying low over water or, or in some other area it can also just be a, a fail safe a, something to keep you safe in case it starts to rain unexpectedly and make sure that the drone doesn't have some sort of catastrophic failure all these features help reduce the liability to the organization because if something were to happen that organization could be held liable so anything we can do to, to reduce liability is huge all right, so now on that subject, we're taking a look at the UAV health management system. This is a new feature introduced on the Matrice 300, and I'll give us a run through of what this is. Uh, so first off, uh, we'll have an ability to see the health status monitoring, and this is gonna provide an overview of the status of all the major components. Then we have flight data management. This records the flight data and provides maintenance suggestions accordingly. So that's huge for maintaining your aircraft. Now we have an automated way to help notify us when maintenance is needed. Uh, next, we have our flight log management. This allows you to export your flight records. Let's say you want to work with DJI support to try to understand why something happened or, you know, if you had a warranty claim or something like that. Now it's easy to export the flight logs. Anybody who had to do this before know it could be a bit of a process. So nice to see DJI simplify that. Uh, we also have firmware management, which helps you manage your firmware versions. Same thing, anybody who's done multiple firmware updates know that this can be a taxing process. And then we have error records and troubleshooting guidelines. So if you're tasked with managing a fleet, you need some way to track flight hours between aircrafts, and this is a really simple solution. Also to add, the ability to minimize downtime for basic troubleshooting issues is critical. Having troubleshooting guidelines available even in remote locations can help you minimize uh, the downtimes that your crew might experience. Uh, so do you guys have anything to add? I know Francisco, you've helped you know manage and grow DJI's fleet. How important are these new features? Hey, yeah, yeah, no, they're extremely important. I mean, when you have a, a large fleet you know you can't keep track um as easily of your flight hours of each drone right so having this um a very user friendly interface to to see like your total flight hours of the drone is extremely helpful also the error records right sometimes when you're flying you you might get a notification of something but you miss it because you're flying right so it's great that now we have a notification system for our users to look back and see uh what what error uh popped up at the time of flight or you could also look at that at a later time as well. So this is, this is very, very helpful. Uh, the troubleshooting guidelines is also helpful for, uh, for minor issues. Like let's say you have a visual, um, visual error for the optical avoidance. In the past, you might have to look this up uh, on our website or somewhere else to kind of figure out what to do. So with this, you can minimize downtime, just like you said, um, by looking at the troubleshooting guidelines. We'll provide some steps for you to try first um, before you have to uh, take it into DJI support. So, yeah, I think it's a uh, it's it's really really valuable for our users. 
Yeah, thanks. Well said. I mean, look, the last thing you want to do is send a crew out to some remote location and then have them be out there and lose a day because of some, you know, basic troubleshooting issue. And, you know, these are things that can unfortunately happen. So this is a really nice feature there. And Mark, right. that's a, a COA requirement actually for public safety also to have aircraft management, pilot management, and have a system that's actually recording that information. So in order to get your COA approved, your certificate of authorization approved, you need to show that you are doing these things and for the aircraft to have that ability to keep track is, is vital. Yeah, yeah, good, good point there. Um, that's a great point. So next we're gonna look at some more safety and redundancy features. So the M300 has dual IMU, barometer, compass, RTK, and batteries. This provides redundant components for improved reliability this is important and is a key dif differential between consumer and industrial grade drones because the redundancies can reduce the liability to your organization by providing increased reliability and increased fail safes. We also have the all new advanced dual control, which we're gonna get into later on in the presentation, but this allows you to change pilots mid-flight uh, and that opens up a whole lot of new applications as well. And we're gonna get into that later on. Some other redundancy features include the new three propeller emergency landing, which is a fail safe in case one motor or propeller fails. So if you're out there flying, let's say like an Inspire 2 and a prop fails, I mean, it would be catastrophic. Whereas the M300 can recover, then slowly reduce altitude for a semi-controlled landing. We also have the ADSB receiver, which allows pilots to see other manned aircrafts in their area. Uh, and keep in mind that the drone pilot will see the manned aircraft, but manned aircrafts will not be able to see your drone. So it's, it's a receiver only. Lastly, the M300 has a new wide angle FPV camera, which is a, a great way for pilots to quickly, you know, have a forward facing camera. The FPV camera is a much wider, wider field of view and much higher resolution than the FPV camera on the Matrice 200. Uh, and anybody who's had a chance to fly with it has really had like really positive feedback. It's a really nice uh, high resolution FPV camera. One thing to consider is that you, unlike the FPV camera on the Matrice 200, you can't tilt this FPV camera down but the increased field of view more than makes up for this. So uh, guys, what do you think? Why is that FPV camera so important? How are operators using the FPV? So it's, it's extremely important for situational awareness and have the ability to switch it on to see the direction of the aircraft and what's around it is important. I'd like to say that each one of these different features are common in reducing liability for the aircraft and for the operator. And with public safety, that's a major concern, as you know, uh, if something goes wrong while we're out doing a mission or flying an aircraft and we lose control of that aircraft or it goes into a, a car or a freeway, it's going to make national news and, and it's going to discourage the uh, acceleration of programs nationwide. And I think most all public safety, both fire and police, are very, very aware of that. So anything we can do to mitigate that liability, we try to adopt. So to have all these different features in place is, is something that not only can we put that in our COAs, but we can document this information and, and also to reduce that liability for the agency or department. Yeah, thank you, Derek. Uh, Romeo Francisco, anything to add before I move on? Just one thing I want to add in regards to the FPV camera. I, I've gotten some... Uh, comments about the, the inability now to, to look down with the FPV camera. And those are valid points. However, there are other ways to get to gain that view. Uh, that used to be very co commonly uh, implemented, like when, when you're coming back for landing and uh, you want to quickly look down and make sure that your landing area is, is available and no obstacles are in between. Uh, now you can't do that with the FPV camera, but you still have your payload cameras. So uh, you're not losing the ability, uh, but it is a huge improvement as an FPV camera from previous models. Yeah, that, that's a great point. I mean, you definitely still have your primary cameras. And one thing that we were testing at the shop was just by flying back like 15, 20 feet, we were able to see kind of what was what was below us at that at that further point. It's such a wide angle that you can start to see uh, what's below you when you're like 20 feet back, if that makes sense. Uh, but I hope you guys all get a chance to fly with it. It's a really nice slick FPV camera and definitely one of the nicest uh, forward facing FPV cameras I've gotten to fly with. So next, we're going to move on to advanced intelligent features. Before we do that, I have one quick correction regarding the battery case. I want to make sure that I stated this correctly. 
The battery station can hold up to eight TB60s and four WB37s at a time, but it charges two TB60s at a time, starting with the set with the highest charge. Once that set is automatically ch is charged, it automatically switch, switches to the next set. So it's charging sequentially. But the key takeaway with the battery station is that it will charge batteries quick enough so that way you can enable continuous flight like we discussed earlier. But I want to make sure I stated that correctly. Okay, so moving on. Now we're going to talk about some of the new advanced intelligence features. So Francisco, you want to give us a run through on these new features? Sure thing. Yeah. So the first thing we'll talk about is the smart pin and track. Um, so the main three functions we'll talk about is the pinpoint function, smart track, and location sharing. Great, so pinpoint. Um, this is a new feature that we've added to mark an object of interest. So there's two ways to do this. The first way is through the main camera view like you see on the right. Um, by simply selecting the, the pin option, which is next to the RNG symbol, um, you can you can mark uh, an object in real time. So that's the first way. The second way to do this is to do it through, through the uh, map interface. Um, and once it's marked, it'll keep track of that object in real time. So no matter which direction you're flying, you can easily see where it is. And you'll also get the uh, direction in the navigation display below, which you should see um, it's next to the green, I'm sorry, the red arrow. But yeah, so this is a, I feel you guys can elaborate more within public safety, but we feel that this would be a, a great add-on for, for your operations. There's many uses for public safety uh, on the fire department, you know, to keep track of a, a victim or, or, or somebody who's out in the field or whatever else, but I see a lot of use for law enforcement, and I'm sure Romeo can elaborate more on that, but just to be able to keep track a suspect Go ahead and uh, tell us what you know on that, Romeo. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the the features that this can help is, you know, oftentimes we have elderly people with dementia problems that that wander away, and uh, drones are utilized to help locate the individual. And now, if you have the ability to, uh, you know, pinpoint a location and send that information to to the team, it's just so much more helpful. Or if, if you're done with your search and you need to fly back for a battery exchange, you can drop a pin so you know where you left off immediately uh, and can go straight back to that point. I mean, those are some really good ways of utilizing this feature. Yeah, and those, that's a good point that you can also drop a pin on hotspots so you can keep track of where those are at to identify that and communicate that information to the IC also. Great, next we have smart track. So uh, similar to some of our consumer models now, we can uh, track objects. So predefined objects such as uh, vehicles, people and boats will automatically be detected. You will simply have to select the object that you want to detect, and the aircraft and gimbal will automatically track it. So as it's tracking it, it's keeping it uh, in frame, zooming in as necessary, and keeping it in focus. Um, and it'll actually be displayed in the uh, map interface on the bottom. You can see a green crosshair, um, and that is the location of the object as it's moving and tracking it. So again, uh, we feel like this would be great for uh, public safety, and you know, if you guys do think so as well, please let us know. Yeah, I mean, this is going to be huge. Anybody who's tried to do this shot where you track a car and have it pass in front of the drone and now you have to do a 180 pan knows this is a really hard shot to pull off and you're likely to lose track of the car and now you have to try to find it again on the other side. Like right here, as the car switches past the drone, that's a hard shot to pull off. And if you lose track of the car, maybe you lost it for good. So this is a huge feature and I would say a necessary feature. Derek, Romeo, what do you guys think? I agree. Like I said, this type of feature is, is is extremely powerful. I just see law enforcement being able to use it quite a bit, obviously, for many reasons. Yeah. All righty. Right. And finally, we have location sharing abilities. So if you're using Flight Hub, um, whether you're tracking something with the smart track or uh, you're utilizing the pinpoint function, you'll be able to share this uh, in real time with Flight Hub. Got it. And for those not familiar, Flight Hub is a 
uh, flight data management software that DJI offers. So this is something that you would use in conjunction with the M300 to get even more information down to the incident command. Uh, anything else that you guys want to add there? Um, only that I, I don't, we're probably going to talk about this more, but we're also able to transmit a signal. If we put the second smart controller with the IC, that all this information that we're finding while we're tracking and everything else, we're able, he's able to actually pick up all the stuff that's happening on the screen. So as we're tracking, basically he's got all that same information, which is extremely valuable. Well said, Derek, thank you. Awesome, next we'll talk about the smart inspection. So smart inspection is composed of these three functions, Waypoint 2.0, live mission recording, and AI spot check. So we can dive deeper into each one. So the first one is Waypoint 2.0. So previously we had uh, supported only up to 99 waypoints, um, but with this new upgraded waypoint function, we can support up to 65,535 waypoints. Uh, we now also support banked turns and more dynamic flight routes. And this does support uh, POI as well, uh, supports multiple payload options and offers multiple consecutive actions. And waypoint 2.0 uh, will be supported uh, for third-party payloads, such as uh, uh, through the payload SDK. And this is, this is also supported uh, by our mobile SDK and onboard SDK. Next, we have the live mission recording. So utilizing the live mission recording, you can create an automi automated flight route. So the first thing you'll have to do is uh, put the drone up in the air in the select areas that you would like. And when you record the waypoints, it'll record the drone's location and also the gimbal's orientation. So all you have to do is fly your mission one time. So in this example, we have, let's say, Tower A. We'll fly that mission one time, save the mission, and now we can uh, automate this and have it repeatable uh, every single time. So you just select that mission Tower A, you'll get the exact same uh, flights and the exact same data. Well, that's huge. I mean, this is going to help organizations provide more consistent results from each inspection and also do their inspections more efficiently. So they'll be able to get a good return on their investment just through the uh, improved quality of their data and the improved efficiency of their data collection. Right. And we take this another level uh, as well. So not only will you uh, will save like your gimbal orientation, you can go into the mission and look at the images and actually annotate what you want uh, to focus on. So if we're looking at this tower, we can focus on these conductors. And once you annotate it, when it goes back and repeats that mission, it's going to take the exact same picture and keep that in frame. So we found that this is, uh, it's actually, it does a better job than a normal person and you get, uh, you get better results and it's very consistent. So another uh, feature that we have is called the high-res grid photo. Um, so with this, we allow you to capture a set of high-resolution photos with a single click. So the first thing the user will have to do is just select an area of interest. Um, once you select the area, depending on your zoom factor of a zoom camera, um, you'll get multiple uh, pictures. Okay, so what we're doing here is we're taking a picture with the wide angle, like you see here, and then with the zoom, it'll go in and take a picture of of every section. So for example, if I select an area here and I have like a zoom factor of five, you can get maybe two or three. Yeah, see, it, it's very dependent on the user. Um, but in any case, once it takes the, the images, um, you can go back into your uh, subfolder, look at the wide view of the image and it'll show like little squares and you can look at every section that you're interested in. So you're not getting like a, a ton of zoomed images and you know, kind of trying to having to figure out where this picture was taken. You get the full picture and you can zoom in on each one uh, for a better workflow. Nice. Uh, so what about on the public safety side, guys? Do you think that agencies will be able to use this new high raise grid photo feature? Well, I know factually that this would come in really handy for arson. So they have to find the origin of a fire where it started and they need to document that information. And the sooner they do it, the better. Obviously, if we go any extended time without doing that, the 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 scene gets contaminated and then it doesn't hold up in court. So to be able to put a drone up and document this information, whether it's electrical or something that it started on the ground, 
is extremely valuable. And then I'd like to go back and talk just quickly on the pre-flight or the uh, autonomous flight that the drone was doing. We can take a perimeter of, the of, of a fire that we need to keep an eye on after fire crews have left, and we need to watch that fire for 24 hours to make sure it doesn't rekindle. To have the ability to take the drone and have it fly autonomously, going through the same track along the edge of the fire is of extreme value also. Yeah, and that's where the thermal camera is going to be uh, beneficial too, because you'll you'll be able to see hot spots uh, before they become you know visible to the naked eye. So here we have the primary flight display. So um, just to note, this is the view that you will get when you're looking at that FPV camera. But, so this is a wide-angle FPV camera. Um, so on the on the top left, we have the horizon and flight path vector. So that's in the middle, um, letting you know the uh, direction of the drone that the pilot is inputting into. Uh, next, we have the horizontal speed indicator on the left. So here we're going at around 4.3 meters per second. On the bottom, we also have the wind speed and wind direction. So we got a lot of feedback from our enterprise users uh, telling us that this was important. So we've added it in here. Next, we have the uh, vertical obstacle indicator um, on the right. Uh, so you can see it's, the, it's detecting the top of the bridge on the top. Um, next, we have the altitude indicator and then the vertical speed and absolute altitude near the bottom. And in the middle, we have the uh, navigation display. So right there, what's not as obvious is that little circle that you see there with the obstacle weighted sensors on the front side and, and the back. Um, that represents a 52 uh, foot uh, circle. Right, so everything within that is within 52 feet. Um, do note that the, the range for the horizontal obstacle wind, it's actually 130 feet, um, but we're giving the user uh, the ability to just see within 52. And here you can see in this example that the um, obstacle avoidance sensor was, um, was decreased so that you can fly safely within these two pillars. So, you know, in general, this, this kind of user interface was um, was uh, brought up by the navigation. But if people are into flying helicopters or airplanes, you know, this, this should look very similar to that. Next, we have the advanced dual control. So as uh, Derek has alluded um, and Mark, you can now control the aircraft. Two people, uh, when they're flying, um, the second pilot can gain control of the aircraft in mid-flight. Um, and this can essentially extend your range of so like we're inspecting a large bridge. Um, pilot A going uh, midway through the bridge can give control to pilot B, and then pilot B can now land at location B instead of location A. So um, yeah, so that's one application. We could also use this for uh, training, and you could also use this in the traditional pilot co-pilot mode where one person is flying the aircraft and the second person would be controlling the gimbal. Got it. So how do you guys see different public safety agencies or industrial companies being able to deploy this new dual control feature? Well, I've alluded to it before, uh, but this is one of my favorite features of the drone, um, to be able to hand off the drone, because you get in situations where you may not have a visual of it anymore. You could be at a brush fire and there's tons of smoke and different things that are happening. And to have a, a, your second pilot located in a, in a second different place and be able to take control of it gives you that much more capability to fly that fire. And then to be able to hand off, you know, the amount of distance that we're going with just one controller to be able to hand off, you basically can daisy chain your, your pilots and you can cover a much larger canyon, a much larger area, uh, giving you a lot more capability. So great stuff. Yeah, and that trainer mode is going to be great. It's, this is a you know a very high end aircraft. Before you put in the hands of our you know our rookie pilot, having the ability to have a trainer mode is so important. All right, and now we're going to take a look at the uh, extensibility and openness of the Matrice 300. Great. So here we have the uh, the Matrice the Matrice 300 now supports uh, the new mobile SDK version 4.12, uh, the new onboard SDK version 4.0, and a course payload SDK. So um, this what this means is that you know if you're if you have a third party software that you prefer to use, you can use this with this drone. Uh, for the onboard SDK, it does support the manifold two. And then obviously payload SDK means that if you're using 
uh, gimbals such as like the Wingsland Z15 Spotlight Gimbal, you can use this on this drone. Nice. And now we'll actually take a look at some of those partner payloads that you mentioned, like the Spotlight, uh, Megaphone, Laser Methane Detector. So it is really great to see DJI have all of these new third-party payloads become available. And uh, you know, let us know if you have any questions about these specifically, and we'll happy, we're happy to you know, dig into each of them individually. And here are just some quick specs on DJI's SDK Global Adoption Program. And also just some quick specs on the aircraft in case anybody wants to screenshot that. You can also find these same specs on dslrpros.com. So now we're going to get into a discussion about how public safety agencies can use the M300 to save lives and resources. We'll start off on the fire protection side. Derek, you want to share your thoughts on how the M300 will benefit uh, fire departments across the country? So as we know, public safety has been using this technology for a while and really started to increase and accelerate when part 107 came out. But along with that acceleration came the technology. And as the technology advances, giving us as firefighters or law enforcement much more capability and control of what we're doing. Also, we're finding we need to train our pilots to be more adapt and understand all the different critical issues there is or they come against when flying these aircraft. But obviously, we'll start with structure fires. There is so much capability and so much we can do with, with a drone at a structure fire given the IC real-time information on what a 360 view of the entire building, whether it's a high rise or a commercial that's down closer to the ground. Uh, we're also able to identify hot spots on a roof, a panelized roof. Uh, I think I shared a story with you guys uh, of a buddy of mine that had fallen through a, a panelized roof. And if we had a drone in the air, we were able to identify, we're just actually mitigating these type of emergencies uh, being able to limit as much as we can what we do. And that's what we do in the fire service anyway. We're always, we have to go into a dangerous area. We have to do dangerous things. We try to limit, the, take the best precautions possible. So having a drone does that. Then in a brush fire, you know, gives us complete visual of what's going on on that brush fire. And this drone here, the 300 we're looking at, it's given us wind direction and wind speed, which is critical on a brush fire. So we're able to relay that, relay that information. Plus the IC is getting it anyways if we're transmitting that video. We're also able to identify hot spots throughout the area. A fire will go out and companies will leave and Santa Ana's will kick in and those hot spots will kindle up again and sometimes burn down structures and people's homes and possibly take a life. So with the ability to go through with a thermal camera, fly that canyon, understand where these hot spots are, uh, identify them and send ground crews in to extinguish them, we are saving lives and we are saving property. And then search and rescue, we've talked about that a little bit. We're able to take vast large areas and take our drone and and do a grid fly a grid a lawnmower type grid to do a search and rescue and we're able to identify as i spoke on that thermal camera uh, that we have something and identify and verify with that zoom camera so we're doing so much with one aircraft up in the air to be able to save lives and to do search and rescue and then we're using drop systems i know dslr pros has got some brand new powerful drop systems on the 200 the 600 and possibly the 300 coming up. But with swift water rescue, we're able to drop flotation devices. We're able to take a tagline, go across, uh, do a tension diagonal across the river. We're able to actually follow that victim that is floating in the river and dangle that floating device in front of them so that we don't lose them. They're able to capture it and then we're, we'll pendulum them to the side of the river, saving their life. So when I look at drones and this technology, I get a little excited because what we're doing is we're saving lives and property, which I take extremely serious. And I'm really grateful for the technology and the people that stand behind it. Got it. Thank you, Derek. And thank you for sharing that. Now on the law enforcement side, Romeo, do you want to discuss, discuss how you see law enforcement agencies benefiting from the Matrice 300? Certainly. And, and I want to add something on uh, just in the transition. Um, Derek is absolutely right, and I was thinking back in 2017 when uh, when we deployed to Santa Rosa for for the the big wildfire, the first big wildfire that we had up here, and the M200 series was fairly new with the XT2, and uh, if I had the capabilities 
of the M300 then, um, there was one incident that it would have made a huge difference. Um, there was a, a home that, that burned down and uh, it was suspected that the resident, an elderly gentleman in a wheelchair, um, who was last seen on the front porch while everybody was evacuating, was uh, in the rubbles in essence. And uh, before we were able to go in with the uh, K-9 units, um, we wanted to fly over and just first of all look for any potential hotspots below uh, all the, the debris so that the K-9 units wouldn't get injured. And then also uh, look for uh, sharp objects, anything that also could potentially be a danger to the paws of the K-9 units. And um, we, we had to do a lot of manual work, uh, unlike what you can do now with the M300. And I think that's a great segment into, into law enforcement that uh, when you have a very dynamic situation, uh, you want to get as much data as, as possible and having the ability to uh, zoom in, but then with, with a less than a second uh, press of a button, you get the wide angle overview. Um, tremendously helpful before you had to zoom out which took several seconds to to accomplish and now it's instant it's instantaneous a huge huge benefit obviously also having now four sensors in one payload and then still the ability to add a spotlight on the second gimbal as it's shown here a, a tremendous helpful tool and we have had several uh, bad guys that in essence have given up to the drone with a spotlight because uh, uh, they first thought it was a helicopter or they, they realized they couldn't outrun the drone and that is really extremely helpful. What it does and we don't talk about it often enough is it's also mitigating the risk to both uh, the law enforcement person on the ground as well as the fire person on the ground and that is a huge side benefit because having better information being able to make better decisions and help save injuries to officers and firefighters or even death has a tremendous impact on not only the economy but also the morale and the environment of a department Obviously, uh, there are other use cases, but I truly think that the laser rangefinder will be one of those components that uh, will give us much more uh, useful use cases in the future that then, again, other solutions can be based upon. Yeah, I, I agree. I think the, the laser rangefinder is going to unlock new features that we haven't seen yet, but it's doing more than just giving us distance reading. It's unlocking new features like we saw with the, the pin drop and who knows what the future will hold. So well said, Romeo, and thank you for sharing that. So now we'll take a look at how different energy companies are able to benefit from the Matrice 300. And Romeo, you want to run us through uh, the energy applications? Yes, absolutely. So, so during during our very initial test uh, period, uh, Belmont was able to really utilize uh, the M300 to change and improve their workflows uh, to inspect uh, some of their power lines. And obviously, the ability to, in essence, fly a mission and have it saved as a future mission that you can do next week or next month and um, it flies autonomously, the very same mission takes the imagery um, the same way as it did the previous flight. So you really have data that you can compare. It's now, you know, apple with apple, not, not you know, from a different perspective, uh, from a different altitude. Now we really have really good comparison models that are being created. That, that improves your efficiency. That improves your return of investment dramatically. And that's not just for energy. Uh, the ability to do that can also be helpful uh, in public safety. If we want to do uh, erosion, cliff erosion, for example, um, and we, if we want to fly this cliff uh, every other day, uh, we can do the exact same flight path with the exact same imagery day after day um, and, and really get a comparison model. So I think that's definitely a, a huge uh, benefit. Uh, as I said, the, the ability to do it with good imagery, now we have uh, much higher uh, sensor capabilities, the 20 megapixel sensor um, with that zoom, 
really provides much more uh, consistency and better quality in your data and features like the AI spot check. So for that repeatable missions, that's what's going to save time, make it easier. And with all of the safety features on board, um, the operator can be much more relaxed in the environment he or she is operating under. Obviously, we still need to be very focused. We still need to take um, all your environment into consideration, but just having the ability to to rely on a few more features, uh, that to me is is really a great step forward. Got it. Thank you, Romeo. Okay, so a, a couple of quick announcements before we get into the Q and A. Um, so with COVID changing the way that we're able to train in person, we're now offering live video conference training. And as a special offer to anybody who attends today's webinar and purchases an M300, we'll include free video training with that purchase. So what that means is an expert instructor will cover all the information you need for setting up, operating, and maintaining your M300. And we'll also discuss the best practices for your specific application. And uh, keep an eye out in your inbox after this webinar, we'll share, we'll share uh, some more details on the promo and you can have a chance to reply back to that email if you have any other questions. And then another, another promo we're running is when it is safe to train in person again, we're offering a 50% discount on in-person training for anybody who attends this webinar and purchases a Matrice 300. So in that, we'll cover all the essentials again, plus you'll also gain some real-world flight experience and a chance to network with other pilots. So uh, if you're thinking about getting an M300, I would highly encourage you to also consider looking into training as well. Training really helps you maximize your investment by learning how to use the gear in and out. All right, and now we're going to move on to a real quick Q&A. I know we are, we're, we're running over as it is, so I'll, I'll hit only a few questions. If I don't answer your question, uh, I'll, I'll email you the answer after when this is all said and done. All right, so the first question comes from uh, our good friend Jared. Is the laser rangefinder an IR laser that is visible under NVGS? Romeo Francisco, uh, any thoughts there? Hi, so, yeah. So, go for it, about, Francisco. Okay, um, so yeah, the laser rangefinder is in the 905 nanometer wavelength. And from our testing, we have found that it is visible with night vision goggles, um, as long as it supports that wavelength. Got it. Thank you, Francisco. Good to know there. Is there any plans to make altitude selectable through AGL similar to a full-scale aircraft? Uh, Romeo, Francisco, any thoughts on that one? I'm not quite sure if I understand the question right. Uh, we now have two different displays of altitude. Yeah. The, uh, the AGL, which is above your takeoff location, and the absolute altitude, which it, it uses the barometer's data, um, which is a more true altitude. Um, so I'm not quite sure, Francisco, I think yeah, more I think... information on that. Uh, could you repeat the question? I don't think I understood it as well. Uh, asking if, you have, if you'll have the ability to not only see uh, AGL, but also ASL. And Romeo, I think you hit it right on the head, which is that new flight display is showing us both AGL and ASL, which is saying that I don't think we were seeing in previous DJI drones. So if you want to have the ability to look at both AGL, AGL and ASL, as we saw in that primary flight display slide, we do have that ability now. And then, uh, and Romeo Francisco, let me know if anything, if I misstated anything there. Perfect. Okay. And then uh, we'll just do one or two last ones here. Can this, uh, can the M300 carry the FLIR hazmat meter or a similar hazmat meter? That's a very good question. I, I'm thinking uh, the the question is in regards to that um, uh, stinger attachment that yeah. went on to leg of the M200 and you could uh, add an additional reader. Now, you may have noticed that the propellers are on the opposite side of, of, of the arm, so they're facing down. Uh, before, all of our products had propellers on top, and this is uh, to give our uh, sensors uh, unobstructed view, but that also means that attachments to the legs of the M300 may potentially be a little bit more challenging to do. But here's what I know. Our ecosystem is fantastic in creating new add-ons that go onto uh, platforms that have changed in design. And I am convinced that 
uh, we will be seeing soon additional ways to attach an external uh, component. So uh, keep your eyes open. Got it. Thanks, Romeo. Well said. All righty. Uh, just a couple of quick reminders before we wrap up here. After the webinar, everyone will receive a link to the recording. So keep an eye out for that. And please uh, share that recording with a colleague. Visit DSLR Pros or email sales at DSLR Pros or mark at DSLR Pros for information on pricing and any of the information on the training promotions we discussed. Also check out our YouTube channel for a detailed comparison video on the M200 versus M300. I wanna give a big thanks to Romeo, Francisco and Derek for joining us today. And uh, I wanna thank all of you, uh, all of the guests who were able to make it out. And then lastly, you know, we at DSLR Pros and DJI wanna thank all the first responders out there keeping us safe every day. We appreciate what you do on a daily basis and are grateful for the opportunity to support this community. Thanks for attending and have a great day. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, everyone. Bye.